people and kill them the fire they love. Send forth their spirit and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, and us instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by the gift of the same spirit that we may be truly wise and never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, for the grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius the Tenth, St. Isidore, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay. Step one is have some cookies. First of all, the lady who made them. No? Oh, this is suspicious. It's really suspicious. <laughs> well, her husband took one, so <laughs> that's not always a sign either. I took two. Oh, she they took two. Thank you. Tried. Take two. Oh, he took two. Might as well. You're reading for two, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well. <laughs> Learning is going to go up considerably. Um, all right, so <clears throat> this will be the last class that we have sort of following the Summa in St. Thomas. Um, so tonight, just going to speak about um, our Lord's relationship to the Father on the side of his human nature. Come late, you don't get the cookies. Um, but oh. yeah, well, there's still up here. <laughs> so St. Thomas, um, he studies the effect of the, uh, the hypostatic union on our Lord. And he wants to consider the relationship of the Son to the Father, of, of our Lord to the Father, and of the Father to our Lord. And he breaks these, this up into different questions. The son to the father, he has several, three questions. And then the father to the son, he has two questions. The, the relationship of, of the son to the father, he speaks about the subjection of our Lord to the Father, our Lord's Prayer, and then our Lord's Priesthood. After seeing those three questions, he, this is uh, question 20, 21, and 22, then he sees um, our, the, the father's relationship to the son he talks about whether our Lord is an adopted son in his human nature and the predestination of our Lord. Whoops, question 23 and question 24. And these, these questions are very nice. They're very um, beautiful to look at. We understand more about our Lord by looking at them. St. Thomas is always considering the human nature of our Lord the human nature, the actions, the activities of our Lord's human nature. And the more we understand our Lord, the more we love him. So if you want to love someone more, you have to know them better. Um, with some people, the more we know them, the less we love them. Um, <laughs> because the more we know them, the more we find out their faults and their idiosyncrasies and so on. And a lot of us as human beings, um, we, we try to put our best face on, like when we meet people, when we interact with people, we try to have our best self forward. But if, you, if, you have, uh, if you're around somebody for an extended period of time, 
the real self eventually has to come out, right? <laughs> and that's that's why I mean, when we when we first meet someone, you can't always trust first impressions uh, because that may not represent the real self behind the person. Well, while familiarity breeds contempt, in some cases, uh, in real life with people we know. Um, that is it, the opposite happens with our Lord. Familiarity with our, with our Lord breeds love of our Lord because the more we know him, the more we understand how lovable he is in himself. Um, so this is probably the main reason why St. Thomas is trying to really think very hard about who our Lord was and <clears throat> um, w w let's just say, the, the humanity of our Lord, his relationship to the Father. So it's very instructive for us to help us love our Lord, honor our Lord, um, and also to imitate him. Because once you love somebody, the natural thing is that you want to be like them. You want to imitate them. So we start with knowledge, then we move to love, then we move to imitation. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, so tonight let's talk about... <clears throat> These questions, uh, we're not going to get through all of it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of material. Um, we're not going to spend much time on the subjection of our Lord to the Father. Was, was our Lord in his human nature subject to the Father? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. He had a real human nature that was created that was less than the Father. He is equal to the Father in his divine nature. He's less to the Father in his human nature. So he is subject to the Father. St. Thomas speaks about the three ways in which we, as human beings, are subject to God. We're subject to God's goodness, first of all. Um, we participate in God's goodness. Um, God communicates his goodness to us. All, all that we have comes from God's goodness. So in that sense, we participate in God's goodness. Our Lord as well, as we've considered in the past catechism lessons, that all the things that, that God endows the human nature of our Lord with, they come from the Father. So our Lord's human nature receives of God's goodness the, the hypostatic union, um, the, the sanctifying grace, the fullness of grace, the beatific vision, the infused knowledge. All of those things come from God then we are subject to God's power, um, the God's ordering of things. So there is an order that God has established for reality, and that holds true for us. So, for instance, the fact that we have to breathe, to live. If you don't breathe, you don't live. That's, that's just the way things are. Um, if you don't eat, if you don't drink, if you don't sleep, then you can't survive. And these, these are laws that are put in place by God, or like the physical laws of the universe. That we are subject to the law of gravity. Where did that law come from? It came from God. Okay. So just by the fact that we live in a reality where gravity holds true in the physical world, and that's put there by God, means we're, we're subject to God's power. He decided that. <clears throat> um, our Lord, too, was, was subject to God's ordering, especially with regards to his life, his providence. And then lastly, us being subject to God's commands, we are subject to God's commands when we obey God's commands. This is something that we do willfully, unlike the order of the universe and unlike being subject to God's goodness. Um, you know, it's, this is one of the terrible things about the modern world, post-revolution, where man wants to become God, is, is we don't really want to be subject to God's goodness. You know, people don't want to be creatures. Um, they don't want, they don't like their human condition because it's subject to the will of another. God's determined their human condition. They don't like anything to be determined by the, for them by someone else. Um, so even though it's a very good thing, what God has given them in their human nature, um, some don't, don't like that. So it's, it's very hard to want to, be, to obey God's commands if you don't even want to be a creature of God, right? 
you don't want to be a creature of God, even at the most basic level, to be what you are, what he has made you, then you're not going, going to want to obey his commands. So we are subject to God's commands when we, when we obey him. Um, for our Lord, his will obeyed all the divine commands. So like, like us, our Lord is, in his human nature, was subject to God in these three ways. Subject to God's goodness, he received from God in his human nature, all that he had in his human nature. He was subject to God's power, God's ordering of his life, of the world. And then he was subject to God's commands by obeying God's commands. Um, so those three things hold true for our Lord just as for us. So a more, um, a, a topic, a more difficult topic for St. Thomas to treat is the prayer of our Lord. Did our Lord pray? Did he pray? Yes. yes, he prayed. And of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, <clears throat> one of them particularly likes to point out the prayer of our Lord um, more than the other evangelists. Any of you know which evangelist is, is like really pointing out more often the prayers of our Lord? Not Matthew. It's not John, even though it's true. Thirteen ch chapters thirteen to seventeen are all the prayers, prayers of our Lord, the words of our Lord. Yeah, it's it's Luke. It's Luke. He um he points out the all night prayer vigils of our Lord, and other times when our Lord would go aside and would pray, he liked to point out this this prayer of our Lord. Um, so we ask ourselves, why is our Lord praying? If he's God, if he's God, um, is it fitting for our Lord to pray to the Father? Is it fitting? And, and if so, why, why is it fitting? We know it's fitting because he's doing it. He's praying. But why? Why is he praying? He was subject to the Father. He was less than the Father in his human nature. And St. Thomas, he goes even more precisely because he wants to ask specifically, is our Lord praying in the sense of, is our Lord asking for things that he does not have or cannot obtain on his own power? So this specific notion of prayer where you're asking God for something you don't have but you want and you can't get because you're too small. Because your power is limited and his power is omnipotent. So that's often what we do. We say, Lord, I am helpless in this situation. I can't make this happen. I really want this to happen, but I can't make it happen. You can make it happen because you have all power. Would you please use your almighty power to make this happen? Right? This is, this is what we, how we pray. This is how we pray. So, did our Lord pray in this way? Um, and St. Thomas says, yes. Yes, he did. Because of the fact that our Lord's human will was not able to accomplish all things. He had a real human will that desired certain things, but was not able to accomplish all things. That's part of what it means to be human, to have the human condition, is that you're going to have unfulfilled desires. Your desires are going to go beyond what you're actually able to accomplish. Because the will can conceive all possibilities. It can, it can desire all possible things. But it doesn't have the power to accomplish all possible things, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know... And it's good for kids to know this. We don't want to uh, discourage kids, but we want kids to know their limits. So, you know, modern education where they're just like, what do you want to be when, when you grow up? I want to be Michael Jordan. It's like, yeah, we'll go for that. Um, and the kids, you know, he's got two left hands or whatever. Um, 
and it might be good to say, well, Johnny, I, I don't think you're going to be a basketball player. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that's your path in life. Um, <laughs> it's just the reality of things, the reality of things. Um, the little engine who could, um, is it, not always able to do everything. So we have limits. We have limits as human beings and we, we do need to recognize that not all things are possible for us. Um, because of the limitation of our own will in, in our executive powers. So our Lord, our Lord's human will was incapable of doing all things, and so he prays. He prays. Um, what about right now? What about um, our Lord right now? Our Lord in heaven, he has, still has his human nature. He has now uh, a risen body, a glorified body. Do you think our Lord is praying right now? To the Father? No? No? Everybody says no? Any any yeses? I'm gonna say yes. He's praying for us, probably. <laughs> <laughs> He's the mediator. He's the mediator. Father and the Son communicate to the Holy Trinity and Really express what I'm trying to say. Yeah. In, in uh, one of the apparitions of uh, our Virgin Mary in 18, come on. The uh, Virgin Mary says, Pray, my children, pray, my son, let himself touch. So, five, that the son has the power to grant. Sure. 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 But so he is in control. More granting is so what what always makes this question what, what's making this question difficult is is the, is the difficulty of distinguishing between our Lord's divinity and our Lord's humanity. Um, and that's that's always what we're trying to do. So on the side of our Lord's divinity, it would be ridiculous for him to pray. Because he does have all power in his divinity. He can do all things. He doesn't need anybody. He doesn't need to ask for anything. He has the power to do everything. But on the side of his humanity, he does pray. He still prays. Um, the, both the, uh, the, the book of Hebrews and the epistle to the Romans speak about our Lord interceding for us, even now. And... At the Mass, the Mass. Is our Lord at Mass? Is our Lord? Yes. What's he doing there? He's, he's interceding for us to the Heavenly Father. He's offering himself to the Heavenly Father for our sins. Okay. That's what he's doing at the Mass. When we go to Mass, he's there on the altar. So we, we, we picture our Lord... Uh, you know, he presenting his wounds to the Father in heaven. We know that he kept his wounds after he rose from the dead. Um, he was say he was saying to the apostles, "Come, see, see these wounds. It's th this is real flesh. Um, it's really I. I'm not. I'm not a ghost." Um, so he kept. He wanted to keep the wounds, and he is still interceding for us with with the Father. So. Romans 8, 24, Christ, who is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Hebrews 7, 25, he is always living to intercede for us. Um, so, our Lord can do everything as God, but not as man. And as man, he prays. He prays for things he does not have and cannot obtain, but God can obtain. Or he can obtain through his divine nature, but not his human nature, right? Um, and he, he prays to instruct us in two things. He wants to show us that he is from the Father says St. Thomas. So in other words, 
one of the things that our Lord wants to accomplish through praying in front of other people is to show that he has a mission from God. He offers his prayer to God, and God immediately grants his request. And people were standing around and said, he must be from God. The Father must have sent him. It's proof of his mission, that he has this mission. One of the instances is in John chapter 11 with the raising of Lazarus. And he prays out loud and he says, I thank you, Father, that you have answered me for the people standing around <coughs> so that they will know that he's from God and they will believe in him, right? So he asked the Father for the raising of Lazarus and then he raises Lazarus. It shows us that he is of God. He's from God. And then secondly, he wants to show us how to pray. Um, so we, uh, we need to talk about the most difficult prayer of, of, of them all, um, his prayer in the agony in the garden. And uh, Julie was asking me about this the other day, and um, it's really complicated. It's a difficult problem because our Lord's prayer in the agony of the garden, he is asking not to have the cross, right? He's asking that the cross be removed from him. And it, it seems that um, it's wrong for him to do that. Yeah, like why, why would he be asking for the cross to be removed? We can understand our Lord praying for other things, but how can he pray for something that he knows is not the will of God? And he knows, oh well, I mean, he's, he's predicted his passion, and that's in Matthew many times, he's predicting his passion to the apostles. And yet here he's in the garden praying the Father that the passion not have to happen. <laughs> How can he do that? How can he do that, right? So, St. Thomas um, makes some careful distinctions. The only way that, that, that he can get to the bottom of this um, is by making difficult distinctions. He asks this question, whether it's fitting for Christ to pray according to his sensuality. And that, that, that's a literal word in Latin, but probably we would say in English, according to his sense nature, according to his sensitive nature. Um, so St. Thomas is going to make a distinction between different parts of the human being, different parts of the human being. So um, human faculties and you have you have what he's calling the sensuality which is which is the sense nature and then the rational will um, we can see the desires of human faculties. So you have different human fac faculties, he says, um, and we can distinguish how they operate. <clears throat> and all these faculties have desires. They want something. They incline to something. They're attracted to something. Your eyeballs, what are they attracted to? They're attracted to light. And when they receive light, they give you the capacity to see the world around you, you know? Whereas your ear is made for audio waves, you know, audio waves. Um, so there's certain inclination of your ear is towards audio waves. If you put light into your ear, if you shine light into your ear, your ear is not going to hear, right? Because it's not made for light. It's not made for light. It's made for audio, audio waves. Um, so our sense nature has its inclinations towards certain goods of the body um, the will the will is inclined towards good in general the universal good 
Within this will, St. Thomas distinguishes what he calls the voluntas <coughs> ut natura and the voluntas ut ratio. So the sense nature is kind of what the body inclines to. Um, the voluntas unatura is what the will inclines to. Before um, reason has a say, and the voluntas ratio is what the will decides will be chosen. Um, so the body inclines to certain things. Um, <coughs> if you are hungry and you're diving down the, the road and you see a billboard with a massive hamburger on it, then, then you're going to start salivating, right? You just, you, you just like feel the, the saliva collect on your tongue <laughs> because your body's reacting. Your body's inclining towards the hamburger. Your body's getting ready to eat the hamburger because it wants the hamburger, right? This is, this is the, the inclination of the body. Um, it's the desire of the sense nature. Right, So we have these bodily reactions to things based on the faculties of the body and what the body inclines to. Now, this is in no way connected to reason. It's, it's just the thing we have in common with the animals. Uh, just like the, the animals have these instinctive movements, so too we, we as well. Um, your, your body's inclined to digest food. Once you eat, it's just going to start doing the di digestion and so on, or, or your body, your, your stomach's going to rumble when it's going to rumble. You know, it's just, it's going to do its thing. Um, St. Thomas says, does our Lord pray according to this? Um, and the answer is no. No one, no one can, no, your, your body can't pray. You, there's, there's no prayer as such coming from your body. Um, you, can, your body you can put your body in a prayerful position, but it's never going to be your body that's praying. Why, why is that? Why do you think that's the case? Because that's not part of your rational nature. So you need a rational nature to pray? Because? Because it requires intellect and will to pray. Yes. Because prayer is a rational act. By definition, prayer is a communication that you have with God at a rational level. God's not a body, right? So, so we, if if you 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 can't you can't your body can't pray because prayer is something that needs to be performed by a rational nature. It can only be performed by a rational nature. That's the nature of the act of prayer. So, Saint Thomas rules this out. Our 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 Lord does not pray according to his sense nature, um, but. He says that our Lord does pray according to the rational will in both, in both <clears throat> of its aspects. He says there's just one faculty because it only has one object. The, the, the natural will inclines towards the good and the rational will inclines towards the good. So they both incline towards the good, but in different ways. The natural will sort of inclines to the good instinctively. The rational will inclines to the good after reflection and making a decision. And this is this is what <coughs> how he solves this problem of, of the agony of the garden. And how can our Lord be praying <coughs> that the, the cup pass away from him? He says that our Lord is presenting to the Father 
the desire of the natural will, the desire of the natural will, is the natural will going to be inclined towards a crucifixion? Is the natural will going to be inclined towards death? Let's just say that you were at the store and there's someone that comes in, they've got a gun and they start shooting someone. Would your natural inclination be to throw yourself on the shooter, you know, um, in order to save the rest of the people? Um, no, no, it, it, would, it would not. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it, maybe if you had gone through incredible training and for though you'd prepared yourself very well for those situations. And even then there'd probably be a first movement where you're just like not really keen on throwing myself in front of the shooter. Um, so the natural will is going to incline towards the good of life, not towards death. And we, we have, we have that, that natural inclination in many situations, and sometimes it corresponds to the will of God, right? Our natural will is corresponding to the will. If, if I'm hungry and I eat, well, God does want me to eat. And, you know, my, my will is inclining to, to eat. My rational will, the, the natural inclination of my will is identifying eating as a good and naturally inclining to it. Um, it would only be my rational will would come along and say, no, it's the time of Lent. I'm, I'm, I'm giving up eating between meals during Lent, so I'm not, I'm not going to have something. So the rational will could come on later uh, uh, on top of that natural inclination. So in the, in the mind of St. Thomas, what is happening in the agony of the garden is that our Lord is presenting to the Father this natural will. Um, and we can, we can say, why, why would he do that? Why would he do that? Why, why would our Lord pray to the Father in this way, um, presenting the, the, the natural will? Because he's human. Because he's human? He wants to show us that he's human, right? He wants to show that he is really human. And so he has the same human reactions that we have to death. Just like we would not be too keen on being scourged and crowned with thorns, being betrayed, spit upon, and being crucified. No human being would, right? And so when we see our Lord recoiling before the prospect of the cross, we say he is really human. Any, is there any other reason why? Could be that in order to accept the perfect will of the Father, he has to admit the imperfect natural will of his humanity, admit it to the point of saying, you know, my human nature rejects this, but, but he did say in his prayer, you know, if this be your will, if it be your will, you, you will be done. Yes, if it's so, possible that this cup Pass from me, yet not my will, but thy will be done. So he wasn't saying that, you know, that he wasn't rejecting God's will, even in his humanity. He's just saying, if there's another way, but that's only his humanity speaking. Right. Which is normal for us. Yes. Yes. It's possible that his projection of his suffering was clouding his ability to rationalize. Higher good than is going to be achieved? I don't think so. I don't think so. Like somehow he could no longer, because he was so terrified that he could no longer see the good of the cross. Um, I don't think so. Um, so, C. Thomas gives three reasons why our Lord would do this. <clears throat> First reason is one that, that Mrs. Fisher gave, that 
to show that he had assumed a real human nature with the affections of the human nature. Second reason, and this is kind of shocking, that it is licit for man to want by natural affection something that God does not want. That when you have this movement of your natural will that, that, that moves towards something instinctively by, by your nature, even though it's not willed by God, it's not wrong. That movement is not an immoral movement. The first movement is not under your control. So that's not an immoral movement. So, but I, I have to make a distinction that is you will not find in St. Thomas when you, if, you re, if you read this article, if you read this article, question 21, article 2. Article 2. So this is article 2. Um, <clears throat> this does not hold true. It's not licit for us to desire what is against God's commandments. Like, like, we would, like if we would say the prayer, um, try to imitate the prayer of our Lord, we say, well, our Lord is praying for something God doesn't want. So I get to pray for something God doesn't want. So I'm going to say, um, dear God, if it's possible, um, let me tell lies whenever I want. You know, let, let me be a dishonest person. I would prefer to be a dishonest person rather than an honest person. If it's possible, please let that happen to me. Um, yet not my will, but thy will be done. I think that kind of prayer would be, would be perverse. It would be perverse because there is God's express will, what he expresses through his commandments, the laws of God that we know. And then there's God's will of good pleasure. And that's, that's sort of God's providence where he shows us in certain signs <clears throat> what we should be doing, right? What, how we should be living our lives. It's more uh, we, obscure than the, the will. And I, I think it's, it's that will where we can ask God to kind of reconsider, like our Lord does. Um, let, me, let me try to give an example from, from the life of, of Isabella of Spain. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you know this story, Isabella, but <laughs> where, where there was, uh, because she was a uh, nobility, there was, there was this marriage that was being arranged for her when she was very young. I didn't think maybe she was, four, she was a teenager. Maybe she was 14 years old. <clears throat> so the guy was old. The guy was not a nice guy. And she was not at all keen with marrying this guy. And um, he's coming to the castle. He's on this long journey to come to take his, his bride for this arranged marriage. And she prayed to God. She prayed to God like nonstop. Um, either he dies or I die. Either he dies or I die. <laughs> she just kept saying that over and over and over again. I think you know what happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah, somehow he kicked the bucket on the way there. Um, <laughs> he, he died. He died mysteriously on, on the way there. Her prayer, her prayer was, was answered. <clears throat> so... Uh, if it's in the providence of God, I mean, she probably wanted him to save his soul, um, but not through marrying her. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so um, she. I think it would be perverse if if death was was the end of everything, but if. Um, if she sees this is going to ruin her life, um, she can ask God to, to intervene, I, I, I would think. So, <clears throat> I think that is more like the prayer of our Lord where, where he's saying, you know, um, let this chalice pass from me. <clears throat> and when, when we have certain crosses and trials, and, and, and there's something that's, that's 
really afflicting us and we're under the weight of some burden, it's not wrong for us to ask our Lord to say, Lord, please, can you remove this cross? This cross is very heavy for me. I'm feeling the burden of this cross. I feel overwhelmed by this cross. Can you please remove this cross? And we can say to our Lord, you yourself had this same prayer that I'm praying to you right now. Um, it cannot be a displeasing prayer to God. Um, but if you want me to carry this cross, I will accept it. Only give me the strength, give me, give me the capacity to carry this cross. If, there's, if the agony in the garden did not happen, we might think that it would be perverse on our part to ask the cross to be removed. We might think it would be a bad prayer if we, we went to God and, and, and said, Lord, this one's really heavy. Can you please take it away? Because, yeah, it's, it's too much for me. We would think that that would be a bad prayer. And we would think that whenever the cross comes, we just have to be all happy, happy clappy with it. Or else somehow we're, we're going against God. Um, we're being disrespectful to God, right? And so we look at the agony in the garden and we see our Lord sweating blood in anticipation of his own um, passion and asking the Father that the cross be removed. <clears throat> and what does the Father do? What does the Father do? He doesn't remove the cross, but what does he do? He sends an angel to console our Lord, um, to be with our Lord because the apostles wouldn't spend time with him. Our Lord is also going to the apostles and saying to the apostles, can you not watch but one hour with me? So our, our Lord is even seeking consolation through human companionship at the time of trial. Whenever we're having difficulties, um, we get a lot of consolation for people being around us and people supporting us, our support team. And the same was true for our Lord, um, him asking the apostles to accompany with him him to, to be with him our Lord is not putting on an act he does he does truly want to feel to the depths um, the horror of what he's he's going to have to go through but he also wants to teach us about how we are to act <clears throat> in times of great difficulty the sort of prayer we can make to God um, not a fancy prayer, because it says he goes back and he, he prays the self-same prayer over and over again. It's, it's, it's the same one, right? Um, he's not having fancy, just like Isabel. Isabel of Spain, she's on not a fancy prayer. It's, he dies right here, one or the other. Um, so, second is that it's listed for man to want by natural affection something that God does not want, but thirdly, that man must submit his affection to the divine will. So you're allowed to present this to God, but you have to use this to subject that to God. You have to do both. And so there's those both aspects of that prayer. Our Lord presents this to God, but with this, he submits to the plan of God. And so he subjects his natural affections to his higher will, his higher will. Um, and this, this is part of it as well. We can't just <clears throat> cling to this stubbornly as this is the, the only thing that we will accept. No, we must accept if God wants us to carry the cross, this particular <coughs> cross, then, then we're going to have to carry it. Yes. No, no. So it's very technical. So Saint Saint Thomas is calling this a rational will. It's there's only one will in us. It's a rational will, but there's two aspects of these of these will, and they're distinguished by their acts, by their operations. Okay. Both of these will have the same object, which is the good. 
because they have the same object, we, we do not distinguish different faculties. According to St. Thomas' philosophical principle, you have different faculties if there's different objects. If you have one faculty that takes in light, another faculty that takes in sound, then you've got two faculties, not one, because their object is different. So here we've got one faculty, the will, with two different aspects. Both of these aspects have the same object, which is the good. They both incline towards the good. But the way they act is different. The natural will is not, does not act under reason. It's not primarily under reason. Whereas the, the rational will is deliberative. So the um, natural will inclines towards good no matter what. The rational will inclines to good after deliberation. So it, it might reject a certain good and say, I don't want this good in this circumstance. It considers circumstances, conditions, context, right? And it might say, I, I'm not going to choose to have this steak because it's Ash Wednesday. My natural will wants it, but my rational will says no. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's, that's his treatment of our Lord's prayer. Um, it's, it's difficult, but, but if, we, if we understand um, what he's saying, it's, it helps us understand our Lord better. It helps us understand our Lord better. Um, and therefore love him more. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time, we just have a little bit of time left, about our Lord's priesthood. Um, was our Lord a priest? Yes, he's a priest. How is he a priest? Says St. Thomas in question 22. It's de fide that he's a priest. It's taught by scripture, especially the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> um, he says, the office proper to a priest is to be a mediator between God and the people. But this applies most to Christ. Through him, men are made partakers of the divine nature and he reconciled the human race to God. So a priest, his job is to be a mediator between the people and God. It's to unite the two, to be the bridge that connects the two. Priests roll the glue that, that brings God in union with the people. So. Our Lord, it's, it's, it's two directions. There's two directions here. <clears throat> One, the direction that goes up to God, and the other, the direction that goes down to the people. Our Lord fulfills both of those functions most perfectly. He unites the people to God by uh, atoning for our sins. So the, the, the major obstacle that was, that was cutting us off from God was our sins. So he atones for our sins and reconciles us to God. Our Lord reconciles us to God by paying for our sins and then secondly our Lord makes us partakers of the divine nature through grace, which he puts in our souls. So on the one hand, he appeases God by paying for our sins. 
and the obstacle between us and him is removed. And on the other hand, he puts God in our souls by giving us grace. So that's how he fulfills the role of priest, supremely fulfills the role of priest. Whereas a merely human priest who participates in the priesthood of Christ, such as myself, I can only communicate to you what Christ gives. I can't do that directly. I can't just like, <coughs> grace, <coughs> give you grace. You know, I can't, I can't do that. I have to use the means that, that Christ has established, the seven signs, which are channels of grace. So I receive a character of the priesthood by my ordination, and with the power that that character gives me, when I perform the sacraments, the rites that Christ has instituted, then you get grace. But I can't just decide, okay, I'm giving out grace today here. You know, Aaron's going to get this. Greg's going to get that. You know, here's some grace. Oh, ran out. Um, so it, I, can't, I can't do that. Um, so our Lord is the supreme priest because he accomplishes the union of the human race with God essentially, in an essential way. Whereas created uh, merely human priests work through the power of Christ. Um, it's through Christ. All right. Um, next question. Was Christ both priest and victim? Yes. Yes. St. Thomas says, Christ, in so far, um, Christ as man is not only a priest, but also a perfect victim. Being at the same time a victim for <coughs> sin, um, the Osea Pacificorum, the, um, I've forgotten the English term for this, uh, the peace bringing uh, victim and the Holocaust. I can't remember the term. Okay, this is, this is very nice. I just want to try to put this on the board real, real quick. Um, three reasons for sacrifice. First of all, remission of sin. Secondly, um, to remain in the state of grace and thirdly to be perfectly united to God yeah I think the second one was called peace offerings Peace offerings in the Old Testament. So you have the Old Testament, what happened in the Old Testament, and then you have our Lord. There were these three types of sacrifices in the Old Testament. In the Old Law, they performed different <coughs> types of sacrifices. There was a sacrifice for the remission of sins, um, victims, or sin. There were the peace offerings, that are uh, mentioned in Leviticus chapter 3, and then the perfect, the perfect sacrifice, you know what the perfect sacrifice was called? The total sacrifice was called in the Old Testament, like Holocaust, the Holocaust, where you would burn the victim completely, completely. No, there was nothing left for the priest to eat. Or, um, so this was the Holocaust. And what St. Thomas is saying is that our Lord is the perfect victim because he unites in himself all three types of sacrifice that were offered in the Old Testament through the one sacrifice of the cross. So, through our Lord, our sins are wiped out.
through our Lord's cross, sacrifice on the cross, our sins are wiped out. Romans 4.25 um, we receive grace um, we receive sanctifying grace that's Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9 Romans 4, 25 says, he was handed over for our sins. Um, Hebrews 5 said, he was made a cause of eternal salvation for everyone subject to him. And then the Holocaust, we receive the perfection of glory. Through him. We have confidence. To the entrance of heaven through his blood. Uh, says scripture. So. St. Thomas's perspective is that. Our Lord is the total fulfillment of the old law. He unites in himself all the sacrifices of the old law and does them better than they were done. So these sacrifices, when they were done in the old law, um, they were still imperfect. They were limited. Um, the Holocaust is mentioned in Le Leviticus chapter 1. Our Lord, by his one sacrifice of the, cr the cross, accomplishes all three offerings and does them most perfectly uniting us to God in the most perfect way. So he's the total fulfillment of the law in, in his one person. So he's both priest and victim at the mass. So that's, um, Yes, okay, Mark Tavish. Yep. Uh, what do you got for me, Mark? <laughs> Is it correct to say that since both aspects of will fell with Adam and Eve in the garden, was it not fitting to restore both aspects of the will in Christ in the garden of Gethsemane? Doesn't Christ's prayer show how both aspects of will become subject to God's perfect will for him through the cross? Well, at the very least, we, we see this perfect example, not, not only of how we pray, but also of the subjection of, of the natural will to the rational will. Yeah, and um, when I had the discussion with Julie, she was reminding me of a sermon I gave. It was, I think, more accurate than what I told her when we talked about it, <laughs> um, where, about, about the alignment, like when, when our heart, is inclined towards something we know it's not the will of God. Uh, we we have to somehow wrestle with our heart to to um, resign ourselves to the will of God, and that this is kind of what we're seeing in the garden, where our Lord goes back um, on three occasions to continue to pray <clears throat> until finally he's he he goes to the apostles and he says, "Rise, let us go." The time is here. Um, and yeah, he's ready. He's re completely ready at that point. Um, and so this is an example to us where we have to keep repeating the same prayer until our heart is ready <laughs> to, to accept that cross that we're finding very difficult. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take time in many situations before we're going to be reconciled to the cross that God may be asking us to carry. And our Lord manifests this perfect submission to the will of the Heavenly Father to something that the human nature finds repulsive, you know. Um, 
So it is a good example in that way as well. Any other questions? Okay, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Our Lady, help of Christians. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. All right, second round of cookies. Third cookie. Tony's 